The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Welcome to a Tuesdays here. It's Hale Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbel. Hope you're doing all right. We'll dive in. More thoughts on the quarterback. Reaction from both coordinators for Nebraska football. A mess on Monday night with the NFL, especially with Nick Chubb. Did you spit your drink out? I did. That was rough to see. We'll get thoughts on the college football weekend ahead as well. Great lineup today. As always, Mitch Sherman going to be with us here in about 20 minutes. Mitch with The Athletic. And uh, we'll talk some Big Red football with Mitch uh, in hour two. Former Husker standout and he uh, scoffs at us calling him that. But Matt Verzel going to talk some O-line and Husker football, the development phase of things. So Verz with us in hour two. And then college football insider Brad Edwards. A uh, thought on Nebraska and a thought on some of those superpowers that are a little powerless this year. Uh, we're talking danger zone time. You've heard it before, but it may be real this time for the Alabamas and Clemsons this weekend. Number to get in, 489-1240. 489-1240 can also hit us up, 800-825-5865. Uh, across the state where you hear us, can stream the show, watch us on video if you can take that, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel or the Hale Varsity Twitter feed, the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at H Varsity Radio. Elijah, what's shaking? How are you? Good to see you on a Tuesday. Oh, I'm feeling great. You know what Tuesday is, Schmitty? It's bowling, bowling night in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I checked the uh, the standings before coming into work here. First place in the league, our team. So uh, feeling good. We have some pressure. You know, you got the targets on our back, but uh, it's a big night. I'm feeling confident, and I'm looking forward to that. Also, it's the start of Champions League football over in Europe. So I know you're not a big soccer guy, Schmitty, but that's uh, that's also an exciting. I hate game it. For me I just well. can't stay awake and watch it. That's that's a me problem because I know there's a lot of soccer fans out there, and I'm I'm not knocking it. My kid played it when he was real little, and I thought there was some talent, non Schmidt like talent, and and he he didn't keep up with it so yeah we're, we're not huge soccer or football fans so we're we're big football football fans american football but so let's get into the quarterback discussion point and matt uh, chimes in here uh with uh, a question about do you put sims in the slot what do you do with harburg right do you, you put harburg at quarterback and sims in the slot listen there's all sorts of creative ways what have we heard about nebraska football what has satterfield and rule wanted you want a positionless offense you've heard it you see it with golden state in basketball where they've kind of got their their, their death lineup and even uh, once upon a time nebraska basketball had a a fivesome to close out the game this might have been during the tim miles era but you see uh, matchup issues all all over the, the the world of sports, the landscape in different sports. So when we want to talk about uh, what Nebraska will do moving forward, well, let's hear from Marcus Satterfield. Let's hear from the OC himself. When it comes to the playmakers, and we can expand on it here, but he's got a good point, and he said this a little earlier today, when it comes to playmakers, they don't need to be standing next to him. Yeah, no doubt about it. We can't have, you know, we got to get our best players on the field, which is an old adage. Any coach is going to say that, but we really got to be uh, mindful of, of, of who's, you know, personnel groupings and getting the right guys in the right places in order to, you know, have some production in the run game. But again, we got guys, we got a what's next mentality. They're going to go out there, you know, not really going to change that much and let them go. So you, you know this, right? Whether you're Team Sims or Team Harburg. You know that both quarterbacks are effective at running the football. They've been very, very good. And to Sims's credit, he's been really good at running the football against better competition. That's not a knock on Harburg. That's just what we've got. We've got Northern Illinois. You have Colorado. And you have Minnesota. So 
You know, Sims can run. It's it's been the turnover issue, and Elijah, the 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 listeners yesterday on the show and and didn't get to him immediately, and just as a bit of a carryover that that you marked down and and looked at. There's a there's a big question mark here by some of our listeners with you know why does Sims still deserve the opportunity? And listen, I know it's it's two games and, and some of you are going off of history and we can beat that up a little bit. Do you think do you think Sims deserves another shot? I I absolutely do. You can't and you don't. Uh, say what Matt Rule has said since he's been here about the best practice players will play and and not put them out there. If Sims is healthy, and I know he got 50 to 55% of the snaps today, if he's healthy and he has a good practice, an equal to or better practice than Harburg, listen, he needs to go out there and get another shot. I know it's not popular. I know there's a lot of fear. And I know that Harburg has one quick sample and and performed well and rebounded well after a turnover that wasn't his fault. Some of the turnovers haven't been on Sims completely. Some of them have, right? I mean, some of them are, are just blatantly obvious. I'm interested to see how the kid rebounds and how does he settle? Because there's a talent. There's a reason you got him. And it was out of necessity. You didn't know what you had. You didn't know what you were keeping. And you know what the athleticism said. And I know it's unpopular opinion here with Sims should get the nod. I'm, I'm a believer of that. You should lose your job to injury. But you got to keep – you shouldn't retain it either just because you, you were once the starter and uh, you lost it due to injury. You're, you're not Teflon. You got to keep it every day in practice – and maybe you perform better in practice, but when Saturdays come, you're still turning the football over and putting the team in, in, in a tough spot. Then you got to watch. You got to watch at quarterback. But I'm not saying you don't find another role for him. And listen, could, could Sims be a guy that you put in the slot? Is, is Sims a, a wildcat option? I mean, that's up to the offensive coordinator and the head coach. I don't think he stands on the sideline, do you? Well, well, do you do you play him if he's not at quarterback? Well, people talk about putting putting Sims in the slot or, or putting him at H back and using him there. Well, we've already seen Heinrich Harburg do that role, and he's done he's, it, he's more done, physical. Done it well. Does it not make sense to have Sims start at quarterback and, and have Heinrich Harburg there? I, I digress. I don't think that's the main talking point for today in terms of how do you get both those guys on the field. I, as I was telling you, Schmitty, before the show, completed my rewatch of Nebraska Northern Illinois, and I have some thoughts on Heinrich Harburg's performance. And I think for the most part, it was a positive performance. Sure. Now, what was Jeff Sims getting killed over for the first two weeks of the season? Staring down his wide receiver. Staring down his wide receiver. He was a one read guy. And if you go back uh, and are watch. Are both guys one read guys? If you go at back and watch Heinrich Harburg on Saturday. He was a one-read guy. Now, that first read came open a lot more often, and I think Heinrich Harburg was a lot more willing than Jeff Sims to tuck it and run whenever that first read wasn't there. You saw him a lot. See the first read. It's not there. He looks down at his line of scrimmage. There's a guy busting through. I'm going to take it around the outside and go pick up four or five yards. He also was more willing to throw the football away. He had a couple throwaways. I still legitimately think that throw to Thomas Fedoni on the sideline may have been a throwaway upon my rewatch. He was getting wrapped up as he threw it. It was, du- it was one of those Dwight Clark moments, you're saying? I think it was one of those plays where he sees Fedoni coming open late, and he's like, I'm going to put it in only a place Fedoni can get it, and if he can't, I'll just tell the coaching staff I threw the ball away. That's kind of how I see it, but I digress. It, again. Well, you know how big that down was? It was third and 15. It was. It, it was third and 15. You get 20 to Fedoni on the sideline. You get a first down, and what happens? You finish off the drive, 76-yard drive, to put him away at 21-3. to mm-hmm. So it was a monster play. Uh, oops, oh, great, I meant to do that or not. But to, to further your rewatch, listen, the, the thing when, when we bump into folks or we get emails or, or there's comments on the chat or phone calls, there's a strong belief out there Nebraska is at worst one and one if Harburg – would have started the season. And my problem with that is that Heinrich Harburg's don't performance know. on Saturday lacks any context. You don't have context for the performance. And you're not going to be able to get context with Heinrich as your guy until the Illinois game. On the road against a Power 5 opponent, 
hostile environment. And we don't even know how hostile Illinois is going to be at that point because they're not looking great this mm-hmm. season. But that's the next point you have to get context if Heinrich Harburg is your starter. Why I think Jeff Sims is your starter on Saturday, assuming he is healthy enough to play, which it sounds like we're moving in that direction, is because that's the earliest place that you can get context around Heinrich Harburg's performance on Saturday. Is you throw the other guy out there against a similar opponent in terms of of talent level and what you're expecting of Louisiana Tech this year, you can get some context on that Heinrich Harburg performance. And hey, also, in the same vein, you can get context on Jeff Sims' performances to start the season. Sure. That's why I think it makes a lot more sense to start Jeff Sims on Saturday. Because, I mean, you go back and watch Heinrich Harburg, he wasn't faultless in his performance. There's a couple times where he put that ball in danger, and I think he was lucky to not have interceptions thrown and, and put against his ledger. But he, but his, his, his tab, his bar bill, was just one turnover where there was an overload blitz that no one picked up, he didn't check out of, or the protection broke down. However you want to point the finger, that's, that's it. And he responded with a good ball game, some completions, some tough running, and he managed the offense with just one turnover. Mm-hmm. Nebraska but, finished the ball game even in the turnover front. Dof- the defense dominated and, and held him to three, just three points off said turnover. And, and we have comments coming in here from Jeff. Uh, he's saying Heinrich Harburg can read the field better. Let's just say he's better at this time. I still think that performance on Saturday lacks, concept, or lacks context because – is Heinrich Harburg, defense, is Heinrich Harburg reading the defense better, or did Northern Illinois come out with a defense that was easier to read? We, we don't really know. We're not the coaching staff. We don't know what, what the play calls are coming in, what the, the, the progression is, according to what the coaching staff wants. It's hard for us to say that he does real, read the field better, and that's why I think you need context. What happens if Jeff Sims goes out against Louisiana Tech, reads the defense perfectly, three touchdowns, no interceptions? I think it's possible, considering the arm talent of Jeff Sims and, and the danger that he presents with his legs, that he can go out and have a performance like that, but you just don't have context the, on his first two games. The bottom line is, is there's a lot of Nebraska fans who've seen enough through two games with Sims, and they're ready to try the backup. They're ready to t- try Hartberg for round two, round three, and beyond because they think he might give Nebraska the best chance to win. He may, but he's got to show that, and I think he could. We're going to get back to, 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 to Cutter's comment here. And listen, Nebraska will get it figured out. They have to. Okay, They have to. They've got incredible defenses that are left on the schedule. They've got to take care of business Saturday against a team that loves to force turnovers while not being a great defense. They're speedy, and they're known to force turnovers if you're not careful with the football. Cutter chimes in. It's not even just the turnovers with Sims. His awareness is not there versus Colorado. He ran out of bounds, stopped the clock. That allowed Colorado to go down and score a field goal. He doesn't really have any awareness. And that can be worked on, but you're not wrong, Cutter. There were some... You know, football IQ things. And there's some football IQ things that weren't perfect either for Harburg. We're not beating both of them up. We're just talking about the topic of quarterback because it it's in play right now. Who's going to be the guy behind center? And you need whoever it is to ramp up, not just for Saturday, but you need him to be somebody on the football team that is like what you've seen from the defense and what you've seen from the offensive line at least while not great on the offensive line, they got better Saturday. You need the quarterback to be better Saturday than they were the previous Saturday at the beginning of the season, you know, and then you need to move forward because you've got a you got the other side of the football that is good enough to get you to postseason. Mm-hmm. And uh, you've got yet a limited offense, but you still have some options on offense. You can win uh, ugly or you can win physically, however you want to term it. But Nebraska has the ability to get some three and outs, flip the field, have a short field, get some special teams help. And I know they're not great on offense, but let them keep working. We've seen how many guys on the defensive side of the ball flash and, and play. I, they're not just paying attention to one side of the ball. I think they're working and developing that offensive side of the ball too. It's not long before you'll get Teddy back. Uh, you might have a, a, a spark on offense with these two young running backs. Grant may find may find a new leaf in in his football life, and really take care of the football and be that that home run threat. And then if you have a quarterback, either the guy that's got all sorts of God given ability, both of them really do, 
uh, you might have that opportunity for them to take a, a jump and and settle in. I don't think you throw you don't throw Harburg's performance away and say, "Hey, thanks for filling in, son." Mm. And you don't throw away Sims quite yet. You let him go at least try and prove that he's better than he's shown in tough situations and get better at his decision making. And then they've got to put him in spots too where. Uh, they, they let him thrive. But quite frankly, can he handle the stage? Can he stay healthy? And can he make better decisions? Give him that opportunity against Louisiana Tech, because guess what? As many times as you ran Harburg, um, Sims could see action again. You don't want his confidence totally destroyed. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think we'll have a pretty good idea at halftime who Nebraska's quarterback is going to be moving forward. What, Th- that's absolutely right. What did the first half look like? What, were the, what was the situation what was the situation? And mm-hmm. did you take care of the ball? Are you up? Are you rolling? Is there a flow offensively? Or is it still, oh, let's get a big play and, and score, and it's, it's, it's still just a slog trying to get any sort of rhythm on offense? But all I ask for is, is some context around Heinrich Harburg's performance on Saturday against Northern Illinois. What did we see? I think you can get that in one half against Louisiana Tech if Jeff Sims is your starter. I don't think you can get that if Heinrich Harburg is your starter on Saturday. And that's why I think Jeff Sims should be the guy on Saturday. And that's that's why people have questioned why do we think Sims is the guy? That's why we don't have context around Harburg's performance. Well, and you know, coaches call. They're going to let him try and keep the job. Mitch Sherman's next. It's that time. Psst. Hey, Mitch. Mitchy. Mitchy, Mitchy, Mitchy. We're looking for you, pal. Mitch Sherman from the Athletic, talking big red. Unleash the fury, Mitch. Unleash the fury! On Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hail Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. We welcome in Mitch Sherman with the Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, what's a good word? How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Having a good Tuesday. How about you? We're good. We are good. We were just talking uh, quarterback, and a lot of the listeners have chimed in on what they want to see. We've kind of laid out what we think we'll see, and I know you had a chance to to hear from Coach Satterfield today on Nebraska's offense. And, Mitch, first and foremost, Nebraska is going to do everything to, to get their playmakers out on the field. That being said, what is the setup? What could be the setup for Sims and Harburg together? Well, it sounds like they're both going to be available. I would say I feel a lot more confident about that than I did at this time a week ago. And to hear Marcus Satterfield say today that Jeff Sims took 50 to 55 percent snaps, uh, presumably with the first team offense. I think that's what he means by that. He said 50 to 55 percent of the snaps, and um, I think. I don't think he was taking reps with the twos, so uh, leads me to believe that they feel good about his chances to play, and you know, I think they're going to take it through the week and figure out exactly how this setup will work. So I, I, I believe that we'll see both quarterbacks, uh, Heinrich Harburg and Jeff Sims, at some point on Saturday. Um, hard to imagine – Sims in a significant role where he's not the starter because that's that's where he was against Colorado and and you know it was clear after that game that he had not lost the job in the eyes of the coaches so I guess my expectation right now and this may change after hearing from Matt Rule on Thursday is that most likely scenario is that we see Jeff Sims start and Heinrich Carberg also getting an opportunity in the game. Mitch Sherman with us here on Hale Varsity Radio talking Husker football and uh, the Husker quarterback situation as it currently stands. And Mitch, it seems to be that the the overwhelming opinion from the fans is that Heinrich Harburg should start. Do you think that matters? No, I, I, I don't think a, co- a head coach and an offensive coordinator can uh, can take into consideration the uh, preferences of the fan, you know, the fans are, are, are going to react in an emotional way. And, and understandably, they all just saw Heinrich Harburg play well on Saturday night and account for three touchdowns and put up 256 yards and his first start. And, you know, that's most fresh in their mind and the memory they have and the, the you know, the, 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 the experience that they've had watching Jeff Sims has been in two defeats where, He's given some things away, um, been really difficult um, 
for him on the in the turnover margin, as everyone knows. You know, I think if he has another outing like that uh, on on even ground with Harburg, where they're playing against the same competition, and Harburg plays well, then you you may see a change. Um, I don't know if everything that's happened to this point in the eyes of the coaches warrants that, but I do think Heinrich Harburg has earned himself an opportunity. And and you know, the reality is with the injuries that Nebraska sustained to the running backs, Gabe Irvin and Nurmir Johnson on Saturday night against Northern Illinois, it's more clear than ever that they're going to need both of these guys um, to step up for the next nine games. It's, it's difficult to say here on this Tuesday after that game what that role, how those roles are going to be divided. But uh, you know, I'm confident that, that both of those players, and, and probably Trevor Purdy in some way too, are going to be needed to get Nebraska through the season. Mitch, spend a minute on some of the, the progress – that you have seen with the, the the quarterback position and just Nebraska's philosophy in general with the, that that Monday through Thursday preparation, the way they've gone about practice, and how early this season how it's paid off to have guys ready. Yeah, the thing about practice that you just hear from everybody across the board um, who's who's on that field, and watching and playing and and coaching is just how hard it is and, and, you know, how hard they hit and uh, how physical it is. Um, you know, they're not tackling uh, backs to the ground um, in practice. Uh, they, they're, they're generally um, during a, during a game week, uh, they're, they're studying up as is the, the terminology on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and, and lighter practices on, on Sunday, Thursday and Thursday. And then, you know, Friday is more of a normal practice, uh, than what you've generally seen with the walkthrough happening on Friday. So they're they're having some added intensity on Friday, and really the walkthrough comes on Thursday. It's a different it's a different kind of setup, and you know I think one that that works well for development. Um, I wrote today about the the development that we're seeing from the third year players who are left in this program, and and because of a, a lot of the attrition that's occurred. Uh, both under the old staff and then during the transition to Matt Rule, there's just there's not much. You know, they've they've lost about half of the recruiting class from the players who who were signed in 2021, and and that that's the group that to develop. That's that's the group that needs to be on track to develop right now. Players who've had a redshirt year and then another year in the program, and and they they generally start to mature and become big contributors in their third season, and. The guys who were left, and that's Heinrich Harburg and Thomas Fedoni and Mackay Bayor and um, you know Kobe Bretts. There's others in that group. Just about all of them are progressing well and developing well. So uh, you know it's early. They're only three games in, uh, and they've had one off season. But I, but I think there's positive signs, especially with that 2021 20, group of of incoming freshmen. That 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 this development thing that we've heard about so much with Matt Rule is in the show uh, is starting to pay dividends already. Mitch, you, you mentioned that 2021 class, a lot of in-state kids that, that mm-hmm. I know you've tracked and you, mm-hmm. you've touched base with Steve Warren about and then the Warren Academy and some out-of-state yep. kids. But together, I mean, despite the, the attrition on it, the, those that have remained, what, seven, nine, something like that, seven or nine kids, one of the two. They're, yeah. They, they they have once they've gotten a chance they've kind of kept their nose to the grindstone and again not to 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 crown anybody but they've been pretty good when they've gotten their opportunity. Yeah, there's about a dozen who were left, and some of them had emerged before this year, like Teddy Prohaska mm-hmm. and Marquise Buford, who's hurt right now, and Gabe Irvin, who of course is hurt right now. Um, Henry Lutovsky emerged as a as a, a depth guy, a second teamer last season. So I was, I'm was i looking more at the guys who had not emerged, who were not on the depth chart last year, either for injury reasons or or because the development wasn't there. And that's where they're at about 85% in, in terms of uh, significant improvement that we've seen just this year. And I think some of that's just natural. And it wouldn't, you know, if, if anyone was coaching, you would see a group of third-year players, you know, they're 20, 21 years old, turning into – college football contributors, but I don't think it hasn't been at that high of a rate in the last few years. That's not the rate that we've seen 
uh, third year players or you know second year players, you can look at their rate of development too. It's not the rate we've seen them uh, blossom. And again, you know we're not talking about a big sample size here, but uh, they are coming along that class in particular. So will be will be important, I think, to continue to track their progress and see how guys like Fedoni and Kobe Brest and Mackay Bayor. Um, develop as this season goes along and what kind of an opportunity Heinrich Harburg has to be a face of, of that recruiting class. I think Marquise Buford, you know, he could come back by the end of the year. Teddy Prohaska is back now and, 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 you know, we'll see if he works his way back into the starting lineup. Uh, so it, yeah, it's, that, I think that's, that's a good uh, barometer for the, the, the type of development that Matt rule and his coaching coaches have, uh, have targeted for this group, and and you know we'll keep watching those guys. Mitch, whenever you you talk about development, what do you make of of the running back group? I know you you briefly touched on this a little bit earlier, but just in terms of these younger guys, they're going to have to step up. What are you watching for from those younger guys in the running back room? I think we'll leave Anthony Grant to the side, but but the guys like Emmett Johnson, what are you looking for from them to see if they develop as as their opportunity? We can assume increases over the next couple games. Yeah, I would expect Emmett Johnson to have a learning curve. He hasn't been uh, out there on the field at running back in his Nebraska career. He's a redshirt freshman, didn't play last year, and, and I don't think he's gotten in on – I know he hasn't gotten in on offense. I don't, I don't know that he's gotten in on special teams. Maybe he has in the first three games for a couple of snaps. But, you know, essentially he's, he's making his debut when we see him, and I expect we will see him in the first half probably against Louisiana Tech. You're not going to give all of the reps to Anthony Grant. Um, and then behind him, it's, it's, it's even more unclear because Quentin Ives is a true freshman you know, who was set for a redshirt year and may now have to step up and play the rest of the season. Um, that's not written in stone. Uh, there, there may be a walk-on, um, and, there, and there are several at the running back spot. I think Nebraska will get creative, and that's one thing that, may come as a byproduct of these running back injuries is that, they're, that Marcus Satterfield is going to be forced to be creative with some things, and, and that can go either way. You know, it can lead to some, some, uh, some <laughs> bad situations if you get creative and it backfires, or it can lead to some big plays that open some things up and open, open their eyes to a set of skills that, that players have that, that, that you, know, you may not have known if you didn't, if you didn't uh, push the issue and, and take some risks. So... You know, I'd like to see Janiron Bonner get more involved. I uh, heard, heard about a ton about him in the spring, and, and he's been out there, but um, not really involved in handling the ball. Uh, maybe Barrett Liebentritt can get a few, uh, a few reps uh, where he's, he's got the ball in his hands. And, and some of the receivers, especially the young guys, with their speed, I think there are ways to get the ball in, in their hands where they're not necessarily having to do all of the intricate things that are required of a more experienced receiver. You know, you could see a jet sweep. You could see more reverses we've had a couple we've seen a couple of those and one worked uh for, for a receiver and then one didn't with tommy hill uh, in in this last game but um they'll continue to push the envelope i think they have to with what they've been dealt on the offensive side mitch will say goodbye what's coming up from you on the athletic i'm uh, just going to continue to follow the developments of this week you know got some offensive stuff and some defensive stuff uh cooking out of the uh, media availability with the quarter coordinators today so um, we're moving toward the uh, final non-conference game, and, and you know things are going to get real next week when when we're talking Michigan. It will be real, and it could be spectacular, uh, or or not. We'll see where Nebraska's at, health and injury wise, and how they progress. Mitch Sherman, read him with the Athletic. Find him on Twitter at Mitch Sherman. Mitch, appreciate you as always, man. Thanks for a few minutes. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Take care. All right, there he is, Mitch Sherman. And don't forget, listen to Mitch. New podcast, The Average yeah, I, Joe Sports I was, Show. I was getting there. I was getting there. The Mitch Sherman, Bill Dolman-led podcast. Yes. We'll have more thoughts from you, more thoughts from the coordinators on the way with Hale Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're here on a Wednesday. No, it's Tuesday. I'm absolutely all screwed up here. 
Let me backtrack. It's bowling night in America, Schmitty. It's Tuesday. It's bowling night, and you laid that out for me. When are you going to wear your bowling gear? Are you going to wear the bowling shirt again? I didn't wear it into work today. We'll see if I make an outfit change when I get home. And it kind of depends on how I'm feeling. Obviously, the bowling shirt's done well for us. My dad did send me a text and say, I better stop talking about how we're in first because I'm going to jinx us. You, there, there is that. You, even with fantasy football, you, you start bragging and then you get drilled the next round. It is Tuesday. I will stare at my calendar. Want you guys to figure out uh, your friends at Dyer Law are there for you when it comes to workers' compensation. Confused about your options for your workers' compensation claim? Put your trust in the team at Dyer Law and help ensure that your rights are protected and that you have the settlement you deserve. Call, call Dyer Law today, 402 402- 393-7529, 402-393-7529, or visit Dyer.Law to chat with a trusted professional about your workers' compensation claim. That is Dyer.Law, 402-393-7529. So uh, make that happen today, and uh, if you're ever involved in a workers' comp dispute, think about your friends at Dyer Law. Well, injuries are on the mind of many with Sims. What's his progression like? Marcus Satterfield from a little bit earlier today. Today was his most active day. Uh, He probably got, you know, 50, 55 percent of the reps. And uh, so he's out there moving around. I I made him keep the ball early on. We do a little team compete period and I I called some stuff where he had to keep the ball and run and he did a nice job with that. So he's progressing uh, at the rate that we thought he would. And uh, the whole group is just, you know, they're, they're working and preparing for Louisiana Tech having a good week so far. Really like this comment from Dion, and, you know, I love hearing from the fan base. Can always put your comments in the stream yard, the Hale Varsity YouTube channel, and uh, dial us up 489-1240. And a lot of Nebraska fans were like this going into last Saturday. Some feel a little bit better, but know it's still going to be a steep hill just at, at this point in time, how challenged the offense is. But the defense, Dion says, I was unhappy until Saturday. Now I'm just enjoying watching the team play. Those black shirts are so much fun to watch. The uh, bleep smasher. You can say that. You can say that. <laughs> Craneck, that's Craneck's term. He can say it. <laughs> That's fair, but like, say you're going to a, a lovely performance at a performing arts center of a, a very popular right Christmas time musical. The Nutcracker. Yeah. Right. That's fine. Yeah. But, what's, but, the, what's the but difference? But it goes well. One is a crack, another's a smash. Yeah. <laughs> one is uh, momentary injury. One is sustained injury. Well, you could argue both are just about walnuts. You okay, know? that's fine. Anywho. Uh, I'll call him the Nuts Manager. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, take is, the fine from the FCC if that comes. I'm sure you will. Uh-huh. <laughs> because their fines are small. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing, Elijah? Ubering to work. Why? Had to sell my car to pay the FCC fine. Uh, just uh, causes a messy pile, and the running backs can't find a hole. No, the run defense has been outstanding. Uh, they've been actually getting after the quarterback as well. No, the defense has been a lot of fun to watch. They just need some help because you don't want to waste that type of type of unit you have. I mean, they're, they're top 25 in the country right now. They are. Well, they're number two in the nation when it comes to rushing defense. The passing defense got a nice jump after what they did to Northern Illinois. But with the, with the, the progression there, listen, Sims at quarterback, you're going to see both. And I think you'll have a determination – You'll have a sample against two opponents, two like opponents, to your point. And then you can make a call based on the week of practice for Michigan. You've had a week where, all right, Harbor got the start. You're going to have a week if he keeps practicing well where Sims gets a chance to keep his job, perform, and be better when it comes to the turnover issue. Better as in, all right, what are your expectations? Does he have to be perfect? Well, not always. Again, it's not all on him but you've got a, a tough history through two games. And I'd go as far as to say the quarterback for Michigan is, is not going to be determined in the week prior to Michigan. I think Matt Rule knows who his guy is going to be, and I think you can throw Marcus Satterfield into that conversation as well. Those two are going to know who their quarterback is for Michigan by the end of the Louisiana Tech game. If, yeah, if Jeff Sims fair. comes in and at least matches what Heinrich Harburg did last week, I think Jeff Sims is your guy for, for the Michigan game. If there's 
anything that causes doubt with Jeff Sims' performance against Louisiana Tech, I think it's going to be Heinrich Harburg. And, I, and that's why I said in the first segment, I think you probably know by halftime, but you for sure will know, I think, by the time Matt Rule gets up to the postgame press conference, who he's going to be rolling with by the time Michigan comes to town. Now, that, that, but it's not uh, in ink. There's still some pencil to it because they do go on practice. And Yed Satterfield asked about that when you look at you know, past performances versus what you're doing in practice. And, and that's part of the evaluation situation Nebraska's in. Um, I'm sure coach would say the same thing. It's a day, it's a day to day deal for us. Like just, you know, go out and compete, see who's you know, going to give us the best chance to win on, on Saturday. So, you know, Jeff's healing up and, uh, you know, getting back to stride, but you know, and Heinrich's having a good week coming off the last game. So we're just taking it day by day and just see what happens. So that's how he handled that. So Scott chimes in. I really think that Northern Illinois has a better defense than Colorado. I don't know about that. I know Colorado's defense isn't great. I don't disagree with you there, Scott. I don't know where to to put Northern Illinois. There's been all sorts of praise last week and post-win about how how tough their front was. But I want to see what what Northern Illinois does the rest of the season moving forward. And there's been a lot of grumbling still about the offensive line. The run game didn't really start doing their thing till later on in the ball game and that's just gonna how it how it's gonna be I mean Nebraska has said that soften them up for the fourth quarter but they they did almost get a hundred in the fourth quarter rushing the football so I like Britton's comment here he thinks they have a better front four but at the second and third level CU is hand over fist better than Northern Illinois you know, the, the back seven's pretty agile athletic and, and fast and physical but again the, the front though i won't disagree like colorado's lines of scrimmage are gonna be on full display come saturday and, and the next saturday and you also can't forget the the impact of a charged home crowd and what it does to a defense talent wise could niu be close to as good as colorado defensively maybe mm-hmm. but from a, a sense of having a home crowd in a student section that schmidt you and i were there in boulder that crowd was charged up all game long a lot of times defenses feed off of the crowd like that. I think that Colorado defense fed off of their home crowd most of that game. And could they put up a better performance than Northern Illinois did in a hostile road environment like they faced in Lincoln and Matt Rule's first game as a head coach? It's very possible. So again, it's, it's, it's kind of getting back to my first point I made about Northern Illinois. It's, it's hard to have context around that performance because it's so different to go on the road at altitude in front of a hostile crowd and go play Colorado as opposed to being back home in front of a supportive home crowd with Northern Illinois being lined up against you. It, it's, it's so hard to compare those two games. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's not really comparable <laughs> do we have time for harburg we uh get the evaluation we do not mm. we'll have uh, more thoughts from satterfield we'll possibly hear from coach white uh matt verzel coming up here in about 15 minutes former husker host a husker hangover uh, get his take on the offensive line and what he thinks about the quarterback situation great to be with you on a tuesday it's hail varsity can join us 489-1240 email the show chris at hailvarsity.com and now and now back to hail varsity radio back with you one final time this hour it's hail varsity you can find the podcast spotify itunes google play download it subscribe to it also the hail varsity youtube channel give that a subscription and catch the show and the follow as well with the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter feed at H Varsity Radio. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, give Elijah a follow at Herbal Essence at Schmidt underscore radio for me. So we were trying to dive into the evaluation part. Elijah's been right on about the context part. Uh, Colorado, Minnesota v. Northern Illinois. Nobody's fault, just what, what you have. And now uh, you had Satterfield open up a little bit, was asked about evaluating Harburg's performance. Uh, I thought he had unbelievable energy. I thought, uh, you know, he had great tempo in and out of the huddle. He had great tempo when we were going no huddle. Uh, I think he ran, ran with reckless abandonment. I think that he was, you know, highly competitive and he took care of the ball. He got, you know, the, I really, you know, they kind of closed in on him on that one fumble. But he did a nice job as many times as he carried the ball, protecting the football. And uh, I thought, he, you know, for his first time out there, Again, that's a big deal. That's, I mean, that's a Nebraska kid getting to start in Memorial Stadium. I mean, I can't imagine what that felt like for him. So 
he handled it well, and uh, he had a really good game. That he did, and he brought some, some, some stank with uh, the hits, I and mean, he finished those runs off at a high level. So, what did he prove? And Satterfield was asked that question. Uh, he's got to take care of his body, for sure. Uh, but you know, that's just kind of who Heinrich is. It's just how he plays. You know, I don't think many people told Eric Crouch to slide, you know, or, or Scott Frost to slide, or Tommy Frazier to slide. It's just a mentality of how that kid plays. Did he prove anything to you on Saturday, Heinrich? Uh, we've seen that. You know, we've seen him do things like that since the spring. You know, that was the the good part of us making quarterbacks live in the spring. You know, he was able to show us what he could do. I was really proud of him. You know, I, I hate to hear him talk about he's not a prototypical quarterback because he is. He can throw the football. He's got a really good brain. He works really hard at it. Uh, and so I, I think he's a you know really a damn good quarterback. And I'm excited to see how he develops, you know, moving forward. Moving forward, Nebraska, Elijah's going to have to throw the football. And Satterfield touched on that because this offense, this offensive line, uh, they can't line up moving forward with his schedule and just get four per carry. It's going to have to be the passing game that also grows with whoever's behind center. I did, and we've got to throw it more. You know, we told the guys again today, like, you know, we have to throw the football in order to win some of these games we're going to have to win uh, in the next, you know, the coming months. So, you know, there's an emphasis to improve our passing game. Uh, and, I, you know, I have, I have faith in Jeff and in Heinrich and in Chubba. I mean, if we, if we had two minutes today and they said Chubba's going out there to do two minutes, I wouldn't flinch. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't bat an eye. So it's a good problem to have to have three guys that can, that have started football games at this level and can throw the football and manage the offense like they can. Well, the it's a good problem to have. Can you get them ready? And, and so far, it's looked promising for Nebraska. Harburg was ready. A lot of that's on Harburg. Uh, pretty, we're waiting on to see that talent emerge if he gets another shot. And then Sims, the, the redemption part where he has a chance to go out and, and keep his job on Saturday against a team that's going to come after him. They're not super big in the front seven. They've got one dude at 390 at the de- defensive tackle. They're pretty light, but they're pretty fast. So this will be a decent test as far as taking care of the football. Decent test terms of taking care of the football, and it gives you a more comparable test, I think, to what we saw with Harburg in, in Northern Illinois. We'll hear from Matt Verzel, former Husker. Gets us kicked off hour two as we continue on with Hale Varsity. You can stream at Hale Varsity YouTube channel. The voice of Husker Nation is on the air. This is Hale Varsity Radio. Insight, opinion, expertise, along with the biggest names talking Nebraska sports. Join in with the show at 402-489-1240 or 1-800-825-5865. Now, here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt and Elijah Herbel. Back into a detail varsity hour two. We welcome in Matt Verzel, uh, P- Pizons Pizzeria, of course, Oscar Hangover, coach at Omaha Scott. Uh, Verz, it's uh, already heading into week four of the football season. How uh, how are things hanging with you? Well, but it flies. I haven't um, haven't been uh, as involved as in past years with staffing and all that fun stuff that everybody's getting to deal with. So. Do what I can. I go on Tuesday and Wednesday that are our majority heavy work days and try to make the games on Friday. I love it. I love it. And, you know, I, I'm interested to get your take on the high school scene. Want to start with Nebraska. And, you know, Heinrich Harburg made his first start, Carney kid, and uh, performed well. I want to know from you, uh, a Nebraska kid, uh, prior to Grand Island, what was it? like to get out on the, the the field that first time do you remember it oh it's it, it's unreal you know so many and it's the tough part about right now is that so many of these kids that come through the system have never seen nebraska win so you know there's, there could be trepidation with that but you know going to games when you're a little kid and then getting the chance to to go out and and wear the the scarlet and cream is always always a fun thing and let's get into this rule philosophy, uh, one through four. The development has been evident through four games where there's a number of guys that you have heard about but maybe haven't seen their 
getting on the field. It's it's hockey line changes defensively and offensively. I mean, you, you're going to have to have a merry-go-round of quarterbacks ready. It sounds like, and for sure at running back. What have you? What's impressed you so far with uh, where Nebraska's at? Uh, the defense is number one. I, I mean, you know, the, the moron Desmond Howard wanted to complain that Nebraska was playing prevent defense against Colorado. And I was like, well, think about it. Every defense is a prevent defense. But <laughs> I, I like the fact that, that they, when the ball is caught, there are multiple players flying to the ball. Like they play a very sound brand of, of team defense. It's pretty awesome to see. So that to me is very cool. Um, you know, need to see probably more out of the offensive line, and then that in turn leads to more out of the running backs. That in turn leads to play action pass, which then opens up the tight end and the receivers. So we don't have anybody that can necessarily take the top off the defense at the receiver position, but I do think they have playmakers. And if you stick to the game plan that you had against Northern Illinois, you're going to win more than you lose coming home. <clears throat> Matt Verzel with us here on Hale Varsity Radio talking Husker football. And, and Matt, let's zero in on the offensive line here. You knew we were going to go there with uh, with your experience. And I want to get your thoughts. What has improved along the offensive line through the first three games when compared to last year? And what still needs some work through the, the final nine games this season? Um, I think in this last game in particular, you know, the, the footwork was better. It, it was a lot quicker. Um, it looked good at times. At times it looked not so good. Um, I think that may be due to, you know, getting caught in the moment where maybe not 100% confident in what you're doing. And, and I always tell anybody, and then if you see any of them, they'll tell you. I'll say to them, I would rather have you be 100 miles an hour and go wrong than, than 50 miles an hour and go right. So it's just shutting off that brain, going out and attacking, and they get out over their skis a little bit. They, they fall off a block sometimes, which is just – getting some arm extension after you make that initial contact. And you know, there are all things that can be fixed through drills and prep work during the week. Let's talk a little bit about, about Teddy P and his buildup. And, you know, if you were to, to, to lay a wager, do you see – do you think you see more than nine snaps from him? Because you would think they're, they're trying to ramp him up and be ready for Michigan. Ideally, in a perfect world, yeah, that's, that's how it goes. I, I – a human being that big and limbs the way they are, you know, you've got to make sure there's no muscular imbalances. Um, your, your footwork is real good and, you're, and, and all those kind of little teeny tiny things because somebody finally explained to me in golf, if you're an eighth of an inch off with your driver face, that's going to result in about 30, 20 yards left or right on the fairway. Well, if you think about that, that's a big human being. So if he's off a half an inch, something's out of line a half an inch when he steps, now you're compounding that going through all those long limbs. So hopefully the, the thought is, and I'm fine with him going in as, as an extra tight end and getting that confidence back in, in everything that's ailed him. And if it is Michigan, great. If it isn't Michigan, oh well. There's, there's plenty of games he can play in down the road. How tough is it to get to get back into football shape after missing so much football over the past couple of years, missing most of the year last year, missing most of fall camp? How difficult is it to, to get from in shape to in football shape? Uh, after being at a couple practices and seeing the <laughs> seeing what they make the, the guys that are hurt go through, they're in pretty good shape, just overall general fitness. If you get a good week of practice, you're going to be that step closer. But there's nothing you can do that can replicate a game speed or, or game mode, I guess. So that'll that'll come. Some of it will be on the fly, but the, he'll be he'll be in shape and ready to roll. Matt Verzel's with us talking Nebraska football. Hail Varsity Radio. Find Verz on Twitter at Verz fifty one. So what? Uh, put your headset on with the quarterback situation and it sounds like it's going to be who does well and is best at practice but also there's the element of not losing your job due to uh due to injury but uh, moving forward here how do you handle the quarterback situation uh it's a good thing about an injury as you can say that injury is continuing to linger <laughs> uh i think the the biggest thing to me in that game was 
Satterfeld called a game that fit the skill set of his quarterback. There wasn't anything crazy with it. Arberg, and he, he will tell you, he was behind on some throws. He, he was late on some throws. But that game plan of you're going to get 15 to 20 runs a game, we're going to hand it off to a running back. Now with more running backs being hurt, you probably have a unique situation where you can talk to, to multiple people and say, hey, you know, we can we can have situations where we have you both on the field, one of you at running back, one of you at quarterback. I'm just spitballing here, throwing out ideas, but that's a way to appease some things, and maybe it works out and it's better, and you just kind of have to examine all options now, or you're going to pull a red shirt on a kid and, and make him play and, and see how he does. Well, Matt, do you think you saw enough from Heinrich Harburg on Saturday to make you think that he should be the starter moving forward, or do you think Jeff Sims deserves a chance for a, a rebuttal, if you will? I, I'm not usually a fan of a two-quarterback setup, but you know, if you go comparatively, Minnesota and Colorado's talent is probably going to be a little different than Northern Illinois' talent, so you're not really comparing apples to apples. Uh, I thought Harburg did a great job of managing the game that he was given to play in, and outside of one, you know, bad set on on pass protection, he would have had a clean sheet uh, for the majority of the time. He made really good reads with the ball. Um, like I said, he was laid on some throws behind a couple receivers. A couple receivers dropped a couple balls for him, so that kind of washes out. But honestly, if, if you're a coach, you have to watch how your team is reacting to each guy. And if it's more hype and it's more electric and it's more fluid during the times that, that one guy is in, then you, you stick to that one guy. And it's... Not always the the best way to go with it, but you have to have a feel of your team and how they view it to make sure you're getting the best out there possible. Vers, are, are you excited with uh, this opportunity for Anthony Grant? Yeah, I am. You know, there's a lot of things that have been said. We don't know if it's from fumbles. We don't know if it's from off the field stuff. And they're obviously to a point now where, you know, they trust him enough to put him in the game. He scored late in the last game against Northern Illinois. Um, runs the ball very well. So for him to be the bell cow now and, and get the carries and, and do what he's supposed to do, let's, let's see if we've matured as a man and, and do our job and do it well and, and take care of all those little things off the field that add to big things on the field. When it comes to young pups at running back, Emmett Johnson, Quentin Ives, both have a lot of talent. Uh, you just haven't seen it uh, at the P5 level. They're going to get their crack as well. In your experience with, with younger backs that have gotten in, what what has kept them from seeing more of a role, and, and what are some exceptions? I mean, what what's best-case scenario? What's normal for Nebraska with, uh, with some unproven talent there to also share the carries? The ones that usually, you know, you see them do well a little bit and then they're, they're taken out, they just try to do too much. It would be... So that high level knowledge of the game that, that not every play as much as we would want it to be is a 75 yard touchdown. Some of them are five yard gains that, that break the spirit of a defense. And can you, can you do those things? Or are you trying to do too much every time you hit the hole and then cut 37 times and then get tackled for two yards shorter than you were at? You know, that, that type of stuff. Ball security is always good in the system. Pass protection, you know, blitz pickup will be a huge thing. And, and do they have a, a well-rounded grasp of the full concept of the offense. Do they know in these situations, I don't necessarily need a home run, uh, but I need to get five yards and and keep the chains moving. Matt, specifically from an offensive point of view, what are you going to be looking for on Saturday against Louisiana Tech? It's a tune-up game. That's why you you pay the money for these schools to come to Lincoln and play you. And I, I think Nebraska was able to iron a couple things out against Northern Illinois. Still some work to do. But as you look ahead to Michigan coming to town in a couple weeks, what do you want to see this Husker football team, and specifically the Husker offense, get accomplished on Saturday to show you that they're, they're making strides and getting better before Michigan comes to town? Just to make it as, as fluid as possible, right? Like, if you can make – the majority of your drives look like your first drive, then you're going to be okay, right? Because it went touchdown, then it was like punt, 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 touchdown, touchdown. So we eliminate the middle where it's punt. Those punts weren't like like long drives, and then we punted uh, like the 50 to play field position. It was like a four-yard gain, a, you know, seven-yard gain. It's like those can't happen, right? There's got to be 
rhythm to it. The, the, the signal caller has to get in rhythm. Um, the players have to get in rhythm. And the line has to continue to evolve. You know, if they can do those things, then then you're okay. But, but I want it to be just a fluid, smooth operating. Calls are in quick. If they have to shorten down the verbiage because we're reading them off of a cue card, you know, maybe we shorten that down and make it so it's just a couple word phrase and everybody knows what they're doing. Burr's high school ball. Uh, Scott's rolling, and, and of course, your your nephew uh, had just a, an incredible outing. Cash, sixteen for two hundred four and a touchdown. Pretty good last weekend for you guys. Yeah, not bad. Old Cash man got out there and did his thing. I know he was pretty frustrated with the first two outcomes, and now they're they're playing a little bit better, and their their old line has picked up a little bit. So he was telling me that they were playing better, and away they go. But yeah, he's. He's a tough kid. He's much like his brother. I, I probably need to have a conversation with him that his future is not at running back. Um, probably more of a linebacker in that situation. But he's a team guy. If you give him the ball, he'll run it. If you if you want to play defense, he'll play it. And, and if you want to play on all the special teams, he'll do that too. So good kid. and glad to see him have a good game. Scale of 1 to 10 as we say goodbye. Uh, Dion Fatigue, where are you at? Uh... I like I like people to be uncomfortable. Okay. So I'm I'm at a zero for fatigue. I have no fatigue of Dion. Uh, I I think he brings a new light to it. I think he brings a new thought process to everything. Um, uh, he's a he's a human being. But like when I'm even right in my life, he, he I have very I'm very confident in myself. Uh, he has never faltered in in the belief in himself in his life, and, and that's a cool thing. And it's harder to do that people imagine, but he has brought to his team that, that regardless of the situation, they're going to win now. If you don't think that people find little silly things to get motivated by in sports, you're crazy. So I know his is right in the public forum and everything's about disrespect and they disrespect this and that. And that that's not a, a Nebraska problem. That's not a Colorado problem. We don't have to worry about what other people think. So. If they if they fired him up because they stood on your logo and you prayed, then oh so be it. Uh, it it's up to you how you want to deal with it. But I have no fatigue of Dion. He pushes the envelope and he shows people, hey, if you believe in what you're doing, surround yourself with good people, and then nobody has his cash rate to bring any amount of talent he brought in, and he's the father to two of them, and he can he can back up a lot of what he says. Now they're going to get into some different situations now, so we'll see how how the rest of it goes for him. What, what little thing did you use to, to turn into a, a, a boulder, motivation-wise? Anything on the field? You know, I had to make sure my spot on the sideline was always good so I could have a good angle to watch. I'm saying um, even in practice, though, yeah. man. <laughs> I know you practice. No, they, <laughs> they, uh, you know, you just you find something. And for us, a lot of the times, it was just hatred, like, you knew when you were at Nebraska during that time, everybody in the state loved you, would do anything that you asked them to do for you. And everybody outside of the state hated you. They hated the side of you, you know, from everything from throwing batteries at Missouri and Iowa State to getting hit in the back of the head with a fifth of Jack Daniels. And, and you know, those just appeared now. The, the good part about it is like, well, we we want to reinforce your hatred. We want to go out and, and and beat you by a lot of points and then make sure that that hatred is justified. So, a lot of things like that. Rob has Rob had one he divulged of late, but yeah, that one was kind of funny. But yeah, you just take little things in the paper that you see and you twist them around and say, how dare they do that and how dare they say those things. And, <laughs> There's anything to get fired up and win. Here's the bulletin board. I love it. Matt Verzel with us. Verz, appreciate you. Good to talk, bud. You bet, boys. We'll see you. Hail Varsity Radio is live. Now, back to Schmitty. Schmitty's a great guy, but he don't have a brain. And Elijah. You want me to speak? When I point you, yeah. On Hail Varsity Radio. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio. We welcome in college football insider and author Brad Edwards. A little uh, 30,000 foot view of college football from Brad at J. Brad Edwards on Twitter. Brad, what a college football it's been. Good to spend a few minutes with you. How are you? 
I'm doing well, Chris. Good to talk to you again. Uh, it's been an interesting start to the season, hasn't it? It has, and there, there's a high level of Dion fatigue with, with my listener base, <laughs> the Nebraska fan base, after many of them went out to Boulder. We were out in Boulder, and that second half didn't go well. But Coach, Coach Prime and company have stayed unbeaten. The uh, number is 9 million tuned into Colorado Colorado State and college football has been highly regional for a long time but your neck of the woods Brad folks that aren't tuning into college football are now tuning in correct yeah it's crazy I was just telling you this uh you know before we got on the air that um I'm now I mean for for most people probably don't know this about me that I, I have recently transitioned to a job in sales and we'll just kind of leave it at that because the rest of it isn't necessary. But in my office, there are a couple of guys who are from Brazil who live in the Boston area. And when I say they're from Brazil, I mean they moved to the United States when they were teenagers. And they have become NFL fans because they're right there where the Patriots are. But they're not college football fans. And I was listening just a few hours ago to a couple of these guys have a conversation, not with me, knowing that I had worked in college football, this is just completely on their own. I was just overhearing their conversation about staying up past 1 a.m. local time to watch the end of the Colorado-Colorado State game. And they're just there are people like that all over the country that are just really enamored with this Deion Sanders story and what he has done, obviously because of his background as a player and, you know, being um, as, as – great as he was on the field to have now transitioned into coaching and, you know, and and quite honestly made the unconventional move from the swag to the power five, you know, and, and now he's, you know, really proving a lot of doubters wrong that he could do it at the power five level. And of course, how good they are remains to be seen. It's a very good chance they could come back to earth quickly in these next two games. Uh, and if they do, I'm sure a lot of that national interest from the, the non-college football fan will wane. But at the moment, just general sports fans are, are very interested in what Dion is doing in Colorado. Do you think the interest, let, let's put a percentage on it, kind of break it down. Is it the, the Dion personality where it is reality TV, it is brash talk that's backed up so far with results? Is it the uniqueness of him flipping a roster, total demolition and then renovation quickly via the portal, or is it the fact that it's been 30 years since Colorado's been good and they're a, they're a new team to take interest in instead of the same four to six teams that have competed and won in the playoff? I think it's mostly one and a little bit of two. Okay. Uh, in that... Yes, he is brash, just as he was as a player, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, Dion is, is Dion, and, uh, and that still carries over to him as a coach. And so he's attention-grabbing. He says things that most coaches wouldn't, um, not quite in the same way that Steve Spurrier used to, but, but you know, in a similar manner. Mm-hmm. Spurrier, you know, would, would blurt out things the typical coach would not in front of the media, and he didn't care. Um, but uh, that, that's what he I think to a lesser extent, the fact that, you know, everything about him is unconventional, including the approach that he took uh, when he got the job, turned over the roster, you know, running a lot of guys off, bringing in a bunch of transfers. And uh, that is part of the story. And um, look, I, I mean, it's fascinating to a lot of people in the sports world, as I mentioned earlier. And, and I know it has to also be frustrating to a lot of fans around college football whose coaches are taking the more conventional approach and building a roster um, slowly the, the way that it typically would be done as opposed to what Dion did. And, uh, I mean, look, and I, I realize I'm about to bring up a name that is going to naturally draw negative attention because of what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. But let's not forget, two years ago, Mel Tucker had a similar situation at Michigan State. Um, Not that he came in and ran a bunch of people off, but he had to kind of turn over a roster and do so through the transfer portal. And 
he brought in a lot of first-year players and had immediate success at Michigan State. For those who, who remember that team, you know, you're obviously seeing the Big Ten. Remember the and, and so Dion is not the first coach at the Power Five level to be able to bring in a ton of new players, try to build that chemistry very quickly, and have a lot of success doing it, whereas a lot of people would have said that that's not how you win at the highest level of college football. Well, now we have another example that it can be done that way. Now, can it be sustained? That, that's a whole different story. You know, a, a program like Nebraska, where Matt Rule is doing it the old-fashioned way, um, they may prove to be a lot better off four or five years down the road than, you know, than Colorado will be with Dion, but that remains to be seen. But at the moment, um, there, there's no question that the, whether you can win at the Power Five level – by immediately turning over a roster and bringing in a bunch of transfers who might be more talented than the guys who left, um, that is doable. Brad Edwards with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Brad, that's the the million-dollar question. Can you sustain it? And Tucker did not and is in the midst of a major, major controversy where there's been a letter of termination by the university. He's going to fight that. Do you think Dion's in Boulder for the long term, the long haul? That is the big question is, is how sustainable is this? Because I mean, with, with Mel Tucker, I mean, the off the field stuff aside, and I know that's, that's difficult to, to say at this moment, but we had already seen the decline in the program. Um, that he got that big contract for success in year one, and that level was not being sustained. Um, and so w- what is going to happen with Dion? The, the other thing is, is if you come in and you do this at a Michigan State or a Colorado and, and not, you know, a blue blood, then even though you're at the Power Five level, I mean, let, let's say Dion does sustain it, uh, after, if not year – well, you know, probably after year one, but, but definitely after year two or three, he would start to get some offers from some programs that could pay him a lot more. And uh, one, one that I know has been hitting the rumor mill hard – because they've got major questions about their current head coach, and they're in a state where Dion used to play professional football, is Texas A&M. Um, and so that's the other question about when you, when you do this and you have immediate success, are you even going to – I mean, the coaches that would do this, are they even going to stick around long enough to be able to build that thing you know, over the course of four or five years? I, I think that's just as big of a question as whether it's, it's doable. Brad Edwards with us, college football insider at J. Brad Edwards on Twitter is where you find him. Brad, what do you think of Alabama this year? I know there's been the quarterback merry-go-round. Uh, Ole Miss is coming into Tuscaloosa. Uh, not a great performance by Bama after a, a, a non-conference loss of all things to Texas just two weeks ago. What's the state of Coach Saban and, and Bama? Yeah, I think the biggest thing with Alabama, for those who haven't watched them play closely, is that the offensive line is a mess. And they expected that to be one of the major improvements with this year's team. They've been kind of mediocre the last couple years when when Bryce Young was the quarterback. And they knew that with a less talented and inexperienced quarterback this year, they were going to need the offensive line to take over and control games. They're struggling to establish the run. They're struggling to protect the passer. And, you know, Alabama has used three different quarterbacks. They went into the fall with a competition between three guys for the starting job. It didn't appear that anyone really separated himself. Jalen Milrow, almost by default from being the guy who had been in the Alabama program the longest, uh, got the job as the starter for game one. Uh, Against an overmatched Middle Tennessee, he did – pretty well started against texas there were some some there was some good and some bad from him in that game and the the bad was two awful interceptions that both set up texas scores i mean just where guys just reading the quarterback's eyes and he just doesn't see a defender throws it right to him so nick saban knew that before conference play started he had to get the quarterback thing figured out because Game one in conference play is this Saturday against Ole Miss, as you you had mentioned. Very losable game. So last weekend, he gave the other two guys a shot. Neither one of them 
distinguished himself, and so he's back to Milrow now. And I, I, I think this is this is the best Alabama has for this year. Um, Milrow is a great athlete with a really strong arm at this stage of his career. Not great at reading defenses. And to be honest, I'm kind of surprised they haven't used him um, by design in the running game more than they have. He's definitely scrambled a few times, made some big plays, but as far as design runs, uh, we haven't seen much of that from him. And so I think that's a big question. You know, now that they have settled on him as the starter, are they going to take better advantage of his skill set by tweaking the playbook a little? Or are they going to stick to what they've been doing the past few years with four guys who are now – uh, starting in the NFL. And let, let's even throw out Jalen Hurts, because Jalen's skill set is, is more in line with what, you know, with what Jalen Milrow uh, would be able to do. And that was a different offense they were running with Jalen Hurts. What they did with Tua and Mac Jones and Bryce Young, that doesn't necessarily play to Jalen Milrow's strength. And so that's a big question. What, what are we going to see with the new quarterback this weekend, or I should say going back to the previous quarterback this weekend against Ole Miss, and to me, the big thing is, unless this offensive line just miraculously figures it out and starts to click, if Alabama is going to even win 10 games this year, I mean, forget contending for the playoff. At this moment, that appears to be a dream. But if they were even to go something like 10-3, and three, that would require their defense to play at a level that they haven't played at since at least 2017. So I think that's kind of where we are with Alabama right now. And, and I, Chris, I think it's very fair at this point to question if they had not done everything that they've done over the previous 15 years, would they even be ranked in the top 20 right now? Because they have not looked like a top 20 team. And, and I think they're just simply sitting there at number 13 right now because they're getting a lot of benefit of doubt. Well, it's reputation right now, and they got to provide a, a different set of optics this weekend. Brad Edwards with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. A national look at college football. Some parallels there with Nebraska and Bama actually at quarterback. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back in Hale Varsity Radio. More college football thoughts, Nebraska and beyond. Brad Edwards with us here. Talking college football in the weekend slate. Clemson and Florida State. Florida State almost got scared. Well, they got scared, and they almost got beat by B.C. Clemson's out of the poll for the first time in forever, first few years of the Dabo era. He's also having a a bit of an issue this season. Clemson doesn't look like Clemson. And uh, it's interesting where Saban really got after the the Bama brain trust about this NIL thing, and, you know, Dabo's been resistant to it uh, for the longest time. Brad uh, and and Clemson seems to be kind of falling down the ladder a bit. Yeah, I think I think the comparison is fair in that you know not too many years ago these were clearly the two best programs in college football. It met in what was it three four? <laughs> well, they they met in four straight playoffs, and three of those were national championship games. And um, you know, in those days, feel long gone. They weren't that long ago, but they feel long gone. Both programs have taken at least one step back since then, and I, I think they're in the similar boat this Saturday of of knowing that, look, if they have it in them to flip a switch, this is where it has to come because uh, Clemson already has a conference loss. Alabama's loss, of course, is out of conference, but if, if either of those teams loses this Saturday, any chance of them having what you would categorize as a good season by their standards is pretty much out the window. And, and so uh, I'm intrigued to see what Clemson uh, – and, of course, Clemson and Alabama are both at home, but I was going to say to see what Clemson at home um, is, is able to, to show here against Florida State. And uh, I would have never imagined before the season started that, that either of these teams would be unranked, you know, going into this game. But Clemson is, as you mentioned. And, and we'll see. I mean, look, their backs are against the wall, and we're, we're going to get their A game. The question is, how good is that? Mm. I actually like their chances here, even though I think Florida State's the better team. Um, but because of the situation, I, I'm leaning Clemson. But um, there, there's no doubt to me that they are they are not what we're used to seeing Clemson be. Quick thought on the Pac-12. A, a nice fare thee well. Eight teams in the top 25. And yeah. a lot of them look really good. And it, it's, the, it's the power five right now with the best quarterbacks in it. Yeah, absolutely. And 
you know, that was all the hype coming into the season was the quarterbacks in the Pac-12. And since then, you know, we, we've, we've added Shadur Sanders to the list. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you look at the quarterback play, and what, what it tells you is that the league is, uh, number one, as deep as it has been in a long, long time and should have the best chance by far it's had in a long time to get a team into the college football playoff, which they haven't done since the 2016 season. But the other side of it is when you have this many solid, or I guess I would say above average teams in a conference, and so many of them have a talented quarterback, it just increases the chances that everyone could take a couple of losses in league play. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst case scenario for the Pac-12 because as we know, up to this point, the selection committee has not put a two, two loss team into that college football playoff. And that that's where you are as the Pac-12 It's like, look, it may be tough competition. It may be very difficult to navigate this conference without a loss, but you better do it without two losses. Uh, if you want to get into the college football playoff, because there's, there's something about that second loss that really turns off the selection committee. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see, you know, what's going to happen to some teams like USC and Washington that have looked so good up to this point in the season. Uh, and yet we know most of the games on their remaining schedules, they can't go out there and, you know, bring their C game and come out with a win. Um, so there's going to be a lot of pressure to perform at a high level week after week. And uh, to be honest, I, I hope the Pac-12 has a good season. I hope they have a team that gets in the playoff because that conference has been so big in college football history, and we know that this is its last hurrah. This is the last stand of the Pac-12, and I'm not saying I give them a good chance to win the national title at this point, but I at least want to see them go out with a playoff appearance. There, there's no off week. I mean, Oregon State's for real. Washington State's for real. Penix and Washington are high level. Chip and UCLA are dynamite. Utah will beat the hell out of you. Oh yeah, Oregon still uh, physical and fast. And then here come the Buffs. Just the Arizona schools. There are a lot of fans in other conferences that say that that's that's the way their conference is. You know, pretty much every year. And now the Pac-12 maybe gets a little taste of it. But however you want to spin it, uh, it looks like it's going to be that type of year for that league. Real quick thought on Notre Dame hosting Ohio State before we talk Nebraska. Uh, danger zone for Ohio State, yes, always going on the road to South Bend, but Ohio State's not looked like they've reloaded this year, Brad. Yeah, and look, I, I think the fact that Alabama has done what it did has taken some of the conversation away from Ohio State, which d- despite looking you know, not like Ohio State, hasn't come close to losing a game. Now, of course, they haven't played anyone um, close to the level of Notre Dame yet. And so I think this is going to be a, a big test. And, and, you know, look, Ohio State this past Saturday did put up the – finally put up the kind of score you would always expect them to. Uh, but this um, – yeah, there's some questions here, and especially about that offense. And what are we going to see against a, a better defense than what they've faced so far? I give Notre Dame a good chance in this game, and uh, and I wouldn't have said that before the season began. Uh, but you know what? You, you look at Ohio State, you look at Michigan, which has at times looked a little lethargic offensively through it, its first three games. Uh, you mentioned Florida State with the close call against BC last weekend and, and, and a number of, of other highly ranked teams. They're more of the highly ranked teams that have looked beatable than have – not looked beatable up to this point in the season. And, and it, it makes you dare to dream <laughs> that this could be the year that we get <clears throat> somewhat of a Cinderella story. Most of these other top teams, I have some legitimate questions about, but two of the teams that I think have looked Im- impressive every time they've taken the field so far are Washington and Penn State. Mm-hmm. And, of course, neither is expected to be or perceived to be the best team in its conference. Brad, last thought on Nebraska. Matt Rule is all about development, the slow build. His practice style has been good for Nebraska. Sims may be back, but Sims, his history has traveled with him to Lincoln when it comes to the turnovers and decision-making. But yeah. the, the topic you touched on when we talked before uh, the season started about Rule and his development, it's going to show up, and it's already showed up with some names and faces Nebraska fans well have 
heard about but hadn't seen, well, there's a lot of guys getting on the field and performing well. Yeah, and look, I, I know this is easy for me to say because I'm not emotionally invested in Nebraska football the way that uh, most of your listeners are, no. but um, this may be one of those seasons where you're just looking for little things. You're looking for the signs of improvement and not necessarily for that to be in the win column as much as you would like it to be. Matt Rule's track record and his previous stops, kind of the slow build, and I think it's, what, typically year three mm-hmm. when the team takes off. That's the way he does it, and it's worked for him. And so if you're going to be a Matt Rule supporter and you believe in the hire, then you can't be expecting big things record-wise in year one because that has not been his pattern. Now, if they win more games than expected, that's a bonus. Really looking at development, looking at you know maybe certain players that uh, you weren't really expecting anything out of who are starting to show some real promise and that's what I would focus on if I'm a Nebraska fan because that's been the coach's track record and he's had success when he's been allowed to to do his thing it's worked Brad Edwards college football insider at J Brad Edwards Brad we'll do this again thanks for a few minutes you got it Chris take care and now and now back to Hale Varsity Radio Big thanks to Brad Edwards for hanging out, talking some college football. Matt Verzel this hour. Mitch Sherman got us going. Want to remind you about uh, buckling up. One of every three and one of every three fatal crashes in Nebraska involves an alcohol impaired driver. Why take chances if you drink? Don't drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office tomorrow. Mike Babcock. Evan Bland going to join the show. Reminder, we're at the Single Barrel Thursday inside the Graduate Road Show Thursday. So start your weekend right. Start your weekend early. Come get a giant old steak, maybe a pork chop. Uh, They have all sorts of incredible choices for you. Over 200 whiskeys to choose from. We are there Thursday this week, Road Show Thursday down to the single barrel inside the graduate ninth and P in Lincoln Friday. All right, Elijah, it's probably my turn to drive. So uh, Friday, we uh, roadie trip up to the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill in La Vista. Excited to be up there Friday, four to six. Come see us if you're in Omaha or the surrounding areas up there as we get to the weekend extended and kicked off four to six Herd at Sports Bar and Grill Friday and then back at the single barrel Saturday for pregame noon to two. So are you going to need uh, a little Red Bull, some pick-me-up? Are you geared up for a win tonight to back up some of this bravado you've got with bowling? Here's the concern. Okay. And is there a guy in your bowling league that looks like uh, the, the dude from Big Lebowski that wore the purple jumpsuit? All of them. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, let's see. How many have wrist, wrist things and how many guys drink Bush Light versus Bud Heavy? It really varies. It varies and I'm not making it. fun. I'm saying when, I would go to the, when I've gone to the bowling alley, it's a steady stream of, of Bush Light bottles. It's a stream of Budweiser bottles. There's the crew that likes the Boulevard. See, there's the, the crew in our group, our, our league. And actually, I'm not sure if they, they rejoined the league this year or not, but they were always putting away Coors Light Tall Boys at an sure. impressive clip every single Tuesday night. Like the Coors, point, that's that's a good call. The, the point where I had to like ask, like, you guys have work in the morning? I'm like, oh, yeah, we're good. We're just avoiding the wives. I'm like, okay, that's fair <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> that's a sweet answer. <laughs> as for me, I, I usually go split a pitcher of Blue Moon with either my brother or my dad, depending on who I'm bowling with. We, it's a, it's a two-man league, and there's three on the team, so we can – we can have some tag out. there. Yeah, we can tag out. But it's usually one pitcher of Blue Moon split between two. That seems to be the right amount. There is a, a right amount of beer to drink during bowling in order to, to find the sweet spot. It's similar to golf Does in that any, way. You yes. don't want to overdo it. You don't want to underdo it. There's a sweet spot to hit. See, the sweet spot, we go golfing with, with Jaybird, and and it, it's, you know, vodka lemonades. And then it's, what do we do in the back nine? <laughs> yeah, see, I avoid that. My sweet spot, you drink a beer in the first game. Mm-hmm. You start the beer towards the back end of the, the, the first game. You start it on that second beer, and you, you work through that one through the second game. That's when you find the sweet spot. Two beers in is the sweet spot. You get to three, and I'm not saying you can't bowl that well, but there is just that sweet spot around two that I'm going with. As for preparation tonight. There's, a, there's the old cranky veteran that is just straight jack and water that just dominates. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of crown and diet guys okay. that, that do pretty well, but the people who are out there 
going for 300s every single week, typically you don't hit the booze at all, if, if that's any indication. I you got to aim for the middle. Yeah, I, I, I'm more of that two beer guy. And then the, the key is is every once in a while you got to have that stinker of a game to keep your average down. Ah, I get you. So my, my average is up right now, so we'll see how it goes tonight. All right, thanks for tuning in. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play for the Hail Varsity Radio podcast. Talk to you tomorrow at 4. Thanks.